Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Mike Van Dusen, Executive Vice President of the Woodrow Wilson Center. I want to welcome you all here. We want to get going because our uh, time is limited. Um, it is uh, indeed a unique opportunity for us to uh, have the distinguished guests we have today. Uh, Secretary Janet Palatano, the um, Secretary of Homeland Security, and uh, the Honorable Alejandra uh, Poire, uh, Mexico's uh, Secretary of the Interior. Uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center is the official national memorial to our 28th president. He's the only president we had who had a PhD. He always felt that you've got to bring the world of policy and, and the world of ideas together. And in the spirit of Woodrow Wilson, we are that bridge between academia and public policy. We try to do the deep dive on global issues. We try to tackle global issues through independent uh, research, through open dialogue, leading to the development of actionable ideas. The Wilson Center, through the work of the Mexico Institute, seeks to improve understanding, communication, and cooperation between the United States and Mexico. The Institute's work focuses on five key areas crucial to the success of the bilateral relationship. Security cooperation, economic integration, migration, border issues, and energy and natural resources. Today, we have the rare treat to hear from two cabinet secretaries of great stature in the two countries who have developed an increasingly strong cooperative relationship on security against significant odds. After each has uh, made introductory remarks, they will spend the rest of our time, we will spend the rest of our time together in, uh, 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 in a discussion about the successes and challenges of uh, of this process. The, um, that portion of our program will be, mar will be uh, moderated by Dr. Andrew Seeley, uh, the Center's Vice President for Programs. Our speakers have graciously agreed to take some questions from the audience uh, later. Secretary Janet Napolitano is the third Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security and is leading our nation's collective efforts to secure the country from threats we face, from terrorism to natural disasters. In each of these areas, counterterrorism, border security, immigration enforcement, disaster preparedness and response and recovery, Secretary Napolitano is building upon the skills and resources of this young department by deploying the best of science and technology. Uh, invigorating partnerships with state, local, and tribal governments and the private sector, our nation's first detectors and first responders, and implementing a bold efficiency review that is making the department a leaner, smarter agency, better equipped to protect the nation. Prior to becoming Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano was in her second term as governor of Arizona and was recognized as a national leader on homeland security, border security, and immigration. She was the first woman to chair, I believe, to chair the National Governors Association and was named one of the top five governors in the country by Tom, Time Magazine. Secretary Napolitano is also the first uh, female attorney general of the state of Arizona and served as U.S. attorney uh, for the District of Arizona. Uh, Secretary Napolitano, you're welcome up to the stage. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mike, for the introduction and a special thanks to the Wilson Center for hosting this program today. I know Jane Harmon uh, couldn't be with us, but I do want to thank, thank her as well for her leadership of the Wilson Center. And I'd also like to thank Secretary Poiré for the partnership we have had and the friendship that we have. DHS and SEGOB have a very close, productive working relationship, and I think that's a testament to the leadership of Secretary Poiré and his predecessors in addressing our nation's, nation's plural, shared challenges. Uh, now, I have been engaged in U.S.-Mexico border issues uh, for almost 20 years now, first as the U.S. Attorney for 
uh, the District of Arizona, then as was mentioned, the Attorney General, and then the Governor, and now as Secretary of Homeland Security. And let me just say, based on that, that 20 years, I believe that our two countries and the relationship that we have uh, has never been stronger uh, and, and more fruitful in the sense of uh, protecting and enhancing security while building other uh, activities that we need to be able to accomplish, such as trade and, and productive travel along the border. I think that relationship uh, reflects in part uh, the recognition by both President Obama and President Calderon of the shared bonds between our two countries, not only as friends and neighbors, but as partners in security and in the facilitation of trade and travel. The shared commitment was perhaps most succinctly expressed in the Declaration on 21st Century Border Management that they issued in May of 2010 a document which enshrines the connected principles of co-responsibility and joint border management. So today I will talk briefly about some of the progress we have made in the past years and indeed uh, the past four years to meet our shared goals, uh, many of which are contained in the updated declaration that our respective departments signed just last year. Uh, the core of the Declaration of Principles is uh, something called the Bilateral Strategic Plan. We just call it the BSP. It's government. We have to have an acronym. Uh, but it includes in the BSP a set of specific goals that we have been driving towards. Among them is a commitment to prevent the illegal movement of people, goods, and contraband across the border. And we've done that in a number of ways. In addition to the manpower, the technology, the infrastructure that the U.S. has added to the border to combat illegal entry and activity, we have developed a robust partnership with Mexico and our Mexican counterparts. We're sharing more information with, with each other than ever before. We're conducting joint investigations. We are working side by side to combat drug cartel violence impede the movement of dangerous people within and between our countries and to uh, curtail other illegal activity. For example, we have now deployed personnel to Mexico, such as our ICE border liaison officers to facilitate cooperation between United States and Mexican law enforcement authorities on investigation and enforcement operations, including drug trafficking and human smuggling. We've increased the number of intelligence analysts working on the border and established a border enforcement security task force in Mexico City to promote greater information sharing and analysis. We're working to address border violence, particularly through the border violence prevention protocols for which Segob has played a critical role. Through these protocols, regional binational teams will undertake joint threat assessments and use that information to strengthen planning and communication between law enforcement authorities. We're sharing equipment and resources, and we have collaborated to strengthen emergency management so that if there is a disaster or accident that spans the border, we are prepared for it, we have plans and protocols in place to address it, and we can respond in a coordinated and effective fashion. And at the same time, we are working to create a more modern and efficient border. We're cooperating on binational projects to replace outdated border crossing facilities by way of example. Now, within the United States, we have invested resources in strengthening busy ports of entry like Nogales and San Ysidro through major infrastructure improvements and greater use of technology. Now, of course, information is critical to identifying threats and taking appropriate action. For this reason, we have also focused on countering threats through stronger information sharing, including the aviation sector. In February, we signed an agreement that will create the technical framework and standards we need for information to be exchanged between the United States and Mexico so we can identify travelers who may pose a threat before their arrival or departure on international flights. Having this advanced passenger information, including passenger name record data, will help our border authorities, help them identify and investigate potential threats earlier, help them coordinate our efforts to combat transnational crime 
by learning more about individuals and organizations that may present the greatest risk and helping us to connect the dots about that and building the capabilities of our partners to leverage our joint resources to combat shared threats. At the same time, we're collaborating on trusted traveler programs, allowing us to expedite entry into the United States for pre-approved low-risk travelers. In addition to U.S. citizens and lawful permanent residents, Mexican nationals are now able to enroll in global entry, which reduces processing time for travelers to under five minutes on average. So in conclusion, we have made some uh, significant progress in realizing the goals of the Declaration of Principles and to foster greater cooperation between DHS and SEGO. Cooperation between our two countries has never been stronger. But we also know uh, that the threats we face are dynamic. We must continue to work together. Uh, this is not a static situation and we should never be comfortable leaning back in our chairs and saying we are done. So I look forward to working closely with Secretary Poiret uh, and with his successor in building on the progress we've achieved to date. And on behalf of our peoples and, and our countries, I think we have made that border zone a safer, more secure zone in which people on both sides of the border can live their lives, uh, can raise their families, uh, can uh, participate in trade and travel uh, with security uh, in mind. So I want to thank uh, you for your help in this, and I look forward to our uh, future partnership in these matters. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, let me just highlight what a treat it is for us to have two secretaries from Mexico and, and the United States, the Secretary of Homeland Security and the Secretary of the Interior speaking today. I think that underlines the importance of this relationship and the degree of cooperation that's, that's going on. Before I introduce Alejandro Poiré, Secretary of the Interior of Mexico, let me recognize the uh, Tony Wayne, the U.S. Ambassador in Mexico. Ambassador Wayne, good to have you here with us. And Arturo Sarocan, Ambassador of, of Mexico in the United States. Uh, Ambassador Sarokan, great to have you here. And, and I should underline, not only are the secretaries so deeply committed to this relationship, but two outstanding ambassadors who are working very closely together to make this relationship work. Um, Alejandro Poiré, who will speak next, is Secretary of the Interior. As you know in Spanish, Secretario de Gobernación does not have a close translation into English, but we call it Secretary of the Interior usually. Um, it is the, what is often called the, the chief cabinet position in the Mexican government. He's a distinguished public servant and also a distinguished intellectual in Mexico. He, he follows the Wilsonian ideal of being both a scholar and a public servant. Um, he started his career as the chair of the Department of Political Science at Itam University where he got his undergraduate degree, went on to teach at Harvard University where he got his PhD um, and returned to Itam at, at one point, I believe, taught at MIT as well, and then went into the Mexican government with a series of very senior and very responsible positions including undersecretary for population and migration, um, director of the intelligence agency, spokesperson on national security, and really an equivalent position of what we might call national security advisor in this country, and now for, for a little more than a year as Secretary of the Interior of Mexico. Dr. Porte, it's a pleasure to have you here. Look we'll forward to your remarks. Thank you very much, Andrew. I, I would like to start by saying thanks to the Woodrow Wilson Center for this wonderful opportunity to share some of our thoughts on, on what has been a really remarkable uh, uh, joint uh, uh, process and a joint um, um, commitment on behalf of the Mexican and the U.S. government to improve our relationship with regards to our shared responsibilities and our shared opportunities. I would like, like to thank Secretary Napolitano uh, for her leadership in um, uh, uh, engaging this relationship in a, in a very, very productive way. As uh, Andrew briefly noted, I've been in different positions in the federal government, both at the Ministry of Interior, but also at the Intelligence Agency, and at, at a, um, uh, a position that, uh, uh, within the National Security Council, helped coordinate the different agencies with regards to security challenges in Mexico. And it is um, very clear to me that over the last several years, one of the persons that has been most productive and most engaging and most uh, uh, consistently committed to improving our uh, relationship with regards to security matters 
is uh, Secretary Napolitano, and uh, it, is, it is a pleasure for me to share this opportunity with her to talk about what we have done uh, uh, briefly um, and to share some of our thoughts with you. Um, Mexico, as you know, has a comprehensive security strategy. We have done so uh, while facing a very, very significant challenge that comes from a different number of, um, of, uh, of uh, explanations. Some of them come from the past, some of them come from our uh, geographical position, but also some of them come from some of the challenges uh, in terms of improving our own rule of law that, uh, that we needed to, to take upon at the beginning of President Calderon's administration. This strategy entails, on the one hand, containing and uh, uh, bringing down the strength of criminal organizations that grew in Mexico over the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, we have some significant uh, advances in that regard. Only recently we captured the leader of the Gulf Cartel, which is one of the uh, longest standing and most powerful cartels in Mexico. He's the 23rd out of the top 37 criminals that were identified only a few years ago as the leaders of those cartels. We have been habilitated 23 out of those 37. This one is a recent operation that, um, that was led by, by Mexico's uh, Navy, a special unit of Mexico's Navy, but that entailed also collaboration from other federal agencies, the federal police and the army, and in particular as well, collaboration and intelligence sharing with U.S. agencies. So I think that, that uh, which is just one piece of information, is a brief testimony to the kinds of things that we have been able to, to build uh, over the last few years and that I hope we will be building upon in the next several months and years as well. We are also in the midst of a very comprehensive institutional reform. Mexico needed to change and to revamp its police forces, its prosecutorial agencies, and also its judiciary system. As you know, it's a federal country, so we needed to do that starting at the federal level, but also pushing ahead at the local level, which is where most of the criminal activity needs to be prevented and enforced. Uh, another piece of information, out of this massive process of transformation of state and local level police forces, we now have over 115,000 state and local police officers which have been formally vetted and approved for service in a very systematic, very comprehensive, nationally supervised process uh, that entails building up the state and local level vetting centers, certifying them by a national authority, giving them the proper funds, and actually start vetting each and every one of the over 430,000 state and level police officers. Out of those, we have vetted, we have passed through this process about 180,000, and we have already identified 115,000 that are apt for service. We're going to improve their payment, we're going, we're improving their equipment, and we are also identifying those who have been, uh, uh, who have not passed the vetting process, and they are starting to be removed from the uh, state and local level law enforcement uh, agencies. That is a process that should take at least, probably at least another year. It has a deadline for the beginning of next year, uh, and we are hoping that most states will be able to meet this deadline. But what is certain is that we now have a nationwide process in place that will guarantee that every single police officer in Mexico, federal, state, and local level, we have passed through this vetting process, and it's a very massive uh, national effort. Uh, so that, I mean, we also have ongoing reforms on the judiciary and the like, but it's just one of the pieces of information that I wanted to share. And of course, we're working very hard to improve uh, the social fabric, in, in particular in areas such as border towns, where we have seen uh, crime actually make um, some of its most damning um, uh, effects. Uh, thanks to this strategy and thanks to collaboration with the United States agencies in a number of ways, uh, uh, we can now speak about places like Tijuana and Ciudad Juarez as being places which have actually diminished quite significantly crime rates in a number of areas. Just when one thinks about Tijuana and one thinks about what was happening only four or five years ago, uh, though we, we, we can see a very significant transformation, not only in crime rates. The homicide rate in Tijuana is probably 75 to 80 percent less than what it was only three or four years ago. Uh, but also in terms of their, the, the local uh, uh, authorities and business uh, leaders' ability to actually significantly reshape the face of a place like Tijuana and improve it for business relationships and, and to increase uh, uh, trade and safe trade and safe travel between uh, both sides of the border. The same is the case in Ciudad Juarez, where we have seen in only a year and a half 
a decrease of over 75% in the homicide rate. And now, right now, Ciudad Juarez has a homicide rate that is lower than a large number of cities in the United States. And that is, uh, uh, that is a testimony not only to what we have done in terms of our domestic security strategy, but also to intelligence sharing and collaboration with uh, U.S. agencies across the border. Um, most of the other things that I wanted to, that I wanted to mention uh, have already been covered by uh, Secretary Napolitano, and that I think is also a testimony to the kinds of things that we are working with together. Uh, I'll just say something about global entry, uh, the Safe Traveler program, because I think it is also an indication of how much we are advancing, not just in terms of enhancing security, but also in terms of improving our, um, our ability to move trade and move people uh, safely uh, between both countries. Um, this program began slightly more than a year ago uh, for Mexicans traveling into the United States. We now have 20 locations, I think, in the United States where Mexican nationals can have a global entry card uh, pre-approved and they can just avoid all of the long lines of immigration uh, to try to do it as quickly as possible. I assume that almost every one of you, if you are Mexican nationals and travel to Mexico, between Mexico and the U.S., have already applied for it and already have your card. But it's already 13,000 Mexicans that have, uh, that have that quality, and I think it is a program that will uh, increase very rapidly. And we, already, we will be starting it in November 1st for the airports of Mexico City and Cancun and Los Cabos such that both Mexican nationals and in particular U.S. nationals will also be able to do the same when they come into these airports in Mexico City and also jump the long lines in those areas. Um, so that's, I think, uh, another program that is worth highlighting. Uh, and I'll just uh, conclude my introductory remarks by saying that it is oftentimes um, not very clearly seen how massive the transformation has been in terms of the relationship between Mexico and the United States. When we review this declaration of principles that Secretary Napolitano was talking about, and when we look at all of the items that it covers, and all of the specific programs and specific transformations that it has brought about in all of the areas of collaboration, only between the Secretary of Governance or Interior in Mexico and DHS, but once we add that up to what has been done between DHS and Customs in Mexico and between all of the different agencies in terms of security, in terms of shared responsibility, in terms of enhancing uh, free and fair and safe trade and uh, travel between our two countries, I think the depth of the transformation has really been massive. I have no doubt that in the next several months, uh, authorities on both sides of the border will take stock of this massive change, will take benefit from how much we have advanced, and will take that as an impulse to further deepen our collaboration. It is true that we face significant challenges. It is true that we also need to keep on working very hard on a systematic basis to resolve the issues that are naturally coming towards us in this very complex relationship. But I think it is a testimony to the efforts of both administrations, President Calderon's administration and President Obama's administration, that we are here now speaking about all of these enhancements and on, on all of these advances while we have a positive outlook on the future. And I'm very thankful for this opportunity. Thanks. Thank you to both secretaries for their remarks. Um, and thank you for agreeing also to, to do a conversational format, because I, I think it is not only unusual to have both of the secretaries give speeches at the same time, but to agree to have a back and forth discussion on these issues, actually. I think that highlights the importance of this relationship and how the two of them see this. And, and let's actually start there, if, if we can, which is, you know, among the many things that you look at, Secretary Napolitano, why is Mexico important? Why do you, you spend a lot of time looking at Mexico? Why is this an important relationship for the United States? And Secretary Parde, why is the cooperation with the United States so important to, to the Mexican government? Historically, there was a, a reluctance to engage with the U.S. So, so why the, the shift there? Well, I think uh, a couple of things. First of all, uh, we share a, a huge border. Uh, we have millions of people who live along the border. Uh, Mexico is one of the lead trading partners of the United States. Um, in fact, it's 
uh, either first, second, or third for a majority of the United States. Um, so, I mean, there's trade relationships, there's a shared border, millions of people live there. Uh, and uh, we, we want to work together so that we create a shared border zone in a way where legitimate travel and trade can be facilitated, but where we can work jointly on, on big issues, the big issues of uh, illegal migration, human smuggling, drug trafficking, uh, violence along the border that uh, we've experienced for a long time. And I think we've jointly decided that we've experienced it for long enough. Uh, and it's time to really look at that border as a shared opportunity as well as a shared challenge. Um, there's a, a quote attributed to many different people. Uh, I always attribute it to Paul Fannin, a former Republican governor of Arizona, who said, uh, God made the United States and Mexico neighbors. We should endeavor to be good neighbors. Uh, I think it helps to keep that in mind. Thank you. <clears throat> I think there is no doubt when one thinks about nearly all of the key issues in Mexico develop Mexico's development that a strong and productive relationship with the United States is going to be one of the top variables influencing that development. Whether it is because of security issues that have to do with drug demand, with um, supply of guns, uh, whether it is with uh, economic development, uh, foreign direct investment, trade opportunities, growth, whether it is with almost uh, uh, even when one thinks not just about border issues on both sides of the border, I think there is no doubt that our shared uh, destiny, if one might call it that way, uh, is something that we need to stay, stay, take stock of and actually work in a very productive way. I think over the last 15 or 20 years, we have been gradually uh, not only deepening some of the areas of collaboration, trade, uh, investment, but also coming to terms with the fact that our security challenges are shared security challenges. Once we uh, engage those problems and um, work together towards addressing them and solving them, we actually find a very significant number of uh, areas of opportunity and enhancement. And um, that is why some of the issues that we have worked on in terms of sharing of information of travelers have an opportunity that they give us in terms of security issues, but they also improve and enhance uh, the travel experience and the investment experience of a number of people that will make our region even more competitive and even more successful in economic terms. So I think uh, it is not just to realize what problems we have and work together on them, but it's also as we engage them as we, and as we deepen our trust and our collaboration, we are finding much more productive and much more creative ways to enhance the well-being of both people on both sides of the border. Well, tell us a little bit about what, what has been the hardest part of trying to work together. What are, what are the things that make it difficult for us to work across the border with each other? And, and what are some of the successes, perhaps unexpected successes, that you think you've had? Things that were hard to get done, but at the same time, you were able to make them happen. You go Anything first. come to mind on well, these? I'll, well, nah. it's all easy. It'll be hard to identify any of those. Okay. But anyway, no, there are. We can talk about publicly also. No, no, I'll say two. Um, one that is very obvious is that the politics of those uh, of these issues are very complex on both sides of the border, uh, and we need to be keenly aware of those politics of what the restrictions and the limitations that our partners on the other side of the border have and make sure that our partners on the other side of the border really understand what the uh, implications, the political implications of what we're working with are as well. So I think that's one thing. And um, that is why a, a close uh, relationship and uh, responsible relationship uh, is useful. And that is why we have been able to do that over the last several years. Uh, 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 in particular, I think, between Segov and DHS, I think that's been one of the successes. It is also clearly the case that interagency collaboration and cooperation is very hard to get done uh, and at any level, uh, even within, within governments. I within think. governments. And uh, it is hard to get it done within governments. We work on it all the time. Uh, and it adds a level of complexity once it's international interagency cooperation. But I think we've, um, we've managed to, 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 to deal with it somewhat successfully as well. I think I would um, add to that. Uh, I think there had developed a, 
a tradition of uh, law enforcement on both sides not trusting law enforcement on the other side. Uh, and uh, a lot of, um, a lot of has gone into that, but we have had to work to, to break down those walls and to really uh, tell law enforcement in the field, we value cooperation and information sharing, and we are looking for ways to do it uh, in ways with uh, vetted officers, which is why the, the transformation and the addition of uh, such a large cadre of vetted officers make, has made such a big difference uh, and in any other number of ways. But uh, getting from the cooperation that we have at this level to the field uh, to make sure that it reaches into the fingertips of law enforcement has, uh, has been a challenge. How have you managed to deal with, I mean, there have been a few incidents, as happens in any security relationship, and we could think of Fast and Furious or Tres Marias or the killing, of, very unfortunate killing of an ICE agent or, uh, a year or two ago. These are things that could have really in another moment blown up the relationship. And I don't want you to talk about the cases in particular because there's ongoing work in all of them. But when these things happen, when these incidents happen, how have you managed to, to get beyond the, the immediate reactions that people have on one side of the border or the other and continue with the message of working together? I'll start. First of all, um, <clears throat> we have a very close relationship with our ambassador in Mexico and Mexico's ambassador to the United States, and that helps a lot. Secondly, um, the ability to uh, know the person on the other end of the phone that you are going to call when something is going badly or there's a problem developing, and to get their sense of what's happening and our sense. And we're both dealing, as uh, Alejandro said, with politics on each side of the border. We're both dealing with press on each side of the border and how the, uh, the populations on each side of the border are perceiving something. So getting through that, working together to, to get to the facts and what actually happens so that we can uh, get that narrative out, I think has uh, assisted very much in preventing some, uh, you know, some terrible, sometimes terrible episodes from getting out of control. And I think in addition to those two, which are, are very important indeed is to learn from each of those cases. And um, some of the learning that, uh, that we have uh, developed from those instances, uh, we need to use it and we have used it productively in terms of developing new standard operating procedures, in terms of developing new ideas for uh, shared communication strategies, in terms of making sure that on both sides of the border we understand what the uh, what the standard operating procedures from some of the prosecutions that need to take place afterwards are. And I think uh, it is also a, um, a learning process that needs to uh, be not just intergovernmental but inter-societal. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that the media on each side of the border is slowly learning what the specific areas of limitations from an investigation on both sides of the border is and what we need to do. But I think to the extent that we understand what are the alternatives that each of us has to deal with a, a particular case, then we can convey that to our uh, colleagues on our side of the border and actually uh, press for some specific solutions when we need to do that and incorporate that into our joint operating procedures as well. Let me ask you a hard question for each of you uh, on specific issues. One of the, the commitments of the U.S. government that's particularly hard to deal with has been money laundering and arms trafficking. Now, this is not all within the purview of Homeland Security, but they do touch on Homeland Security. Are there things that we can be building on and moving into the future so we can do a better job on these issues? Are there things that we aren't doing yet or we're starting to do that can be talked about? And in the case of Mexico, you mentioned, Secretary, that, that Mexico really has some challenges of rule of law. Can you tell us how confident you are that there are changes going on with police and prosecutors in the courts? And one specific question, I see Adela Navarro from Seta newspaper over there, which is one of the great newspapers in Mexico, who is, was speaking here on Friday on, on attacks against the press. And so I wonder if you would tell us about attacks against the press and, and what the Mexican government is doing to deal with attacks against the press as well. Well, I think uh, I'll, I'll just take on the money laundering and the arms trafficking. In terms of uh, illegal financial transactions, money laundering, 
uh, it's really one of the major uh, enablers of uh, narcotics trafficking in, in particular. We all know that. Uh, we have been uh, working very closely on a joint project on uh, money laundering and identifying suspect transactions uh, that I think will uh, really produce some uh, fruit over the next couple of years. So uh, ongoing work in that area. In terms of arms trafficking, we began uh, a couple of years ago checking all southbound rail, uh, looking in particular for weapons. Uh, and also uh, many of the vehicles going southbound into Mexico uh, looking for weapons. Um, and, and so we have said, look, within the purview of U.S. law uh, on uh, the sale of arms and the like, uh, what is it that we could do uh, to try to at least inhibit the amount of arms going into Mexico? Uh, and then as a part of that as well, uh, working with law enforcement in Mexico so that when weapons are recovered after the commission of a crime, uh, we accelerate the ability to trace those weapons to see if we can identify uh, a source within the United States that may be prosecutable. Uh, with regards to attacks on the press, a number of things that have happened. I mean, as you know, um, almost, well, nine out of every crimes in Mexico, committed in Mexico, are uh, jurisdiction of local level authorities. That is why it is so important to transform and improve local level law enforcement in terms of police officers, prosecutors, and also judicial reform. Judicial reform, we passed the constitutional amendment in 2008 to transform all of the judicial system in Mexico at the federal and at the state level. Uh, it has a schedule that will, uh, the final deadline is 2016 to finish. Uh, in every single one of the states right now, four states have fully implemented this uh, effort. Chihuahua, for example, is one of them, and we're getting a much higher rate of convictions and sentencing of uh, things like kidnapping and other crimes, which are uh, certainly helping the effort of the federal government to bring the levels of violence and other crimes down in Ciudad Juarez. In, with regards to that, um, uh, attacks on the press have been focused in a number of states in the northeast part of the country. Uh, we are working with the, authority, with the authorities of those states, but we also passed a couple, a couple of changes to the law. One of them was to make sure that we could make every case of an attack against uh, journalists a federal a case that could be prosecuted at the federal level. That's a recent change. And also a specific mechanism to guarantee protection both for human rights activists and uh, civil society organizations devoted to human rights and also for journalists. That law has been recently passed. This is a national me mechanism. We are going by each one of the steps to make sure that we will have a transparent and effective mechanism. And we are uh, on schedule to have it set up uh, before the end of the administration. And in particular, in, in, in those states where some of these attacks have been performed um, uh, over the recent months. Uh, this is a mechanism that will guarantee and will grant protection to journalists who might be threatened uh, because of the, the way in, uh, because of the, their job and their professional activities. So on the one hand, we will have this mechanism for protection. On the other hand, we are improving our prosecutorial uh, capacities to make sure that any single attack or any single crime against uh, freedom of the press, uh, broadly speaking, can be effectively prosecuted and charged. If, and if I might, uh, this point about capacity building at the state and local level, it goes to um, improving the level of cooperation and, tw and trust between uh, our two countries because uh, with confidence that crimes will be uh, prosecuted, that sentences will be imposed, and that sentences will be uh, carried out, uh, that goes a long way to making sure that we're all doing what we should be doing, which is taking bad actors off the streets uh, so that people can live in a safe environment. Let's, we're going to turn in one second to questions from the audience, but we'll have just about five or ten minutes for that. But let me uh, ask you one final question. We're, we're in the middle of a simultaneous election, 2012. It happened in Mexico. We know a new administration is coming in. The election is coming up in the United States. It may or may not be the same administration going forward, but either way, it will be a new period, even if it is the Obama administration. What lessons do you have for who comes next in Mexico and for who comes next in, in the United States, whether it is 
the same administration or a new administration? What, what are the big pointers as you're, you're talking to people that are coming into a new administration? And certainly, even if it's the Obama administration, lots of new faces will be there. What, what pointers would you say? What do you tell them about the state of the relationship and what needs to happen next? I think the most important thing to realize is that the challenges are so massive and the threats are so clear that as much as we have advanced, it is imperative that the level of effort not only stays at the same level, but hopefully increases on both sides of the border. Uh, this is not something, and I think Secretary Napolitano said it very clearly, this is not something that you can just say, well, we're satisfied, we have built a new relationship, we have the groundwork for what needs to be done in the future, and we'll just keep it there. Oh, no. It's exactly the opposite. Precisely because we have done so much, and precisely because the challenges are so clear, we need to keep stepping forward every single time. We cannot just miss the opportunity of what we have built. We cannot miss the opportunity of all of the areas where collaboration ha is being productive and is being useful. So I think the most important uh, lesson to be learned from what we have done is that we need to take stock of what has been done and improve our uh, relationship on a systematic basis. And that takes a lot of political will, that takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of trust building, which is something that is not done immediately. We have built it up, we should keep it that way, and we should enhance it. Uh, and uh, that takes a lot of personal time on behalf of the, pe the people that are going to be in charge on both sides of the border. And I think it is also very clear that if we get it right, improvement uh, in the lives of people on both sides of the border is very clear. Yeah, and I think, um, uh, and, w and we were talking a little bit about this at lunch, uh, we have been doing so much and it comes so fast. And every day we're also dealing with the crisis du jour uh, that neither of us has really had the opportunity to step back and put a framework really around the totality of the effort that has gone on uh, and I think uh, that is something that would be very useful to have for, for future administrations because this is all part of a very, very uh, large effort and different agencies fit in in different ways and uh, different uh, initiatives take different uh, uh, actions by the different countries and so forth. Um, but the ability to uh, put it in, a, in an intellectual framework that makes sense that can be sustained and continued uh, beyond any one administration is very important. Wonderful. You have cards on your table. If you have a question, please fill out the card. We're not going to have a chance to get to all of them, but someone will come by in about three or four minutes and pick them up from you, so you have to write quickly. And in the meantime, let's take one or two questions from people who raise their hands in the audience. Um, right here. Stephen Donahue. Uh, Stephen Donahue from McClarty Associates. Thank you both for, for being with us. It's almost like a case study in, in what to do right and just following up on Andrew's uh, a question, his last question, and, and uh, parroting some of the remarks of Ambassador Sadu Khan. This is silly season in the politics when every 12 years we have both of our countries in, in this partisan battle at home and the next door neighbor often seems to be the target of what we say. How confident are you both and what are you doing to ensure that your successor, if there is one, uh, continues with this work and, and moves forward instead of backward? I'll start because I'm certain I will have a successor December 1st. <laughs> um, gladly. But um, uh, President Calderon has, st has said it publicly, and uh, that's the instruction that we have to have uh, as good a transition as possible with the incoming government. Uh, we have already had one meeting of uh, the security cabinet, a working meeting with President-elect Peña Nieto and some of his top level, uh, um, the member, top level members of his transition team. We have agreed to have a schedule of different meetings to review all of the areas of the security strategy of Mexico uh, with the transition team so that we make sure that they have all of the right information and all of the diagnostics and all of the uh, elements, uh, and if so wanted, our opinion as well of what, uh, what needs to be done uh, and what we have achieved over the last several years. And uh, believe me, one of the areas uh, where uh, we will, what we'll be talking about is obviously the kinds of engagement that we have had with the United States government and the areas of opportunity that we have been able to tackle upon and that we see as something that is uh, productive for the future. And um, uh, one of the 
I mean, one of the characteristics of the Mexican transition period is it's incredibly long. Uh, a number of, uh, of number of reasons make it way too long, but uh, with regards to this, it actually gives us the opportunity to review closely a number of items in the agenda, and uh, one of the, one of those will be, of course, collaboration with the United States on this security and issues. Well, it's uh, I think um, at, at a certain point, common sense uh, can play a role in policy, and the notion of having a a strong partnership that deals with issues on both sides of the border, recognizing that it's mutually beneficial to both countries, not only from a security standpoint, but from an economic standpoint. Uh, that is a, a thread that runs through, through, through all of this. And so uh, any transition, I think, needs to take that into account. And as I just mentioned, I think having the opportunity to put a framework around it so that uh, it's continued in that vein uh, it could be very important. Uh, I know uh, President Obama is very committed to our relationship with Mexico. I, uh, I, I'm not sure I know what Governor Romney's point of view is, but uh, I have to think that in any kind of a common sense dimension, uh, that the work that has been done over the past years is going to continue. And again, I think we need to have a sense of intensity and urgency about that because uh, the problems are not totally uh, solved. Many of them are decades in the making, uh, and we all have a, a vested interest in making sure that this relationship works. You had your hand up over there as well. Yeah, hi, it's Martha Mendoza, Associated Press. I'm wondering what Good to see you, Martha. Oh, oh. Martha Mendoza, AP. I'm wondering what qualitative impact Merida has had, particularly Mexico's defense budget, $6 billion. Is it more symbolic, or has it really made a difference? I think the key issue when one looks at uh, the Merida Initiative is, uh, well, there are at least three. One of them, of course, is the recognition of shared responsibility over the security challenges that Mexico is facing in particular. And I think the impact of that political notion is, is just goes way beyond what the budget of uh, the Merida Initiative is uh, because it it goes into the kinds of things that we have been working on that are not necessarily specifically uh, budget uh, uh, items uh, in terms of collaboration, in terms of uh, mutual trust, in terms of devising solutions on both sides of the border. And I think so one, one needs to take into account the political impact of that declaration to begin with. Uh, secondly, um, uh, it is clear that Mexico's uh, security budget has increased substantially over the last few years, and that maybe that, while it is not uh, a small program, is certainly not, uh, 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 I mean, in proportional terms, is not that quite that big with regards to that budget. But it is clearly the case that there are certainly some, uh, some of the items that are included in Mary that were obtained much easier, much faster than could have been obtained without this initiative, and I think that, that indeed makes a difference on the one hand. Finally, I think the most important aspect on the ground of uh, the Merida Initiative uh, has to do with the kinds of the hands-on collaboration in terms of training, in terms of uh, 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 shared knowledge about some of the implementation of some of the reforms, and also uh, capacity building uh, on both sides of the border. And I think uh, that has given us not just a framework and a set of budget issues uh, that we work on on a collaborative basis, but beyond that, it has given us a huge network of relationships between different agencies that are certainly a very important and significant investment for the future. Let's uh, shift gears. We have only time for one more question, and we're gonna shift gears for this one, actually. Someone asked in writing, um, you both talked about the success of global entry, and I'm wondering if you can touch on trusted trader programs, including the free and secure trade program. And this is something you've both worked very hard on, and, and the question of how do we have secure flows? How do we have flows that, that both move much more quickly, commercial flows and people flows across the border, and at the same time are much more secure? Do you? There have been a number of activities in the trusted shipper type uh, programs designed to, uh, in essence, allow us to, to move some of the work of the border uh, into the interiors of our country so that uh, cargo that is um, signed, sealed, and delivered by the time it reaches the border can go through a, a fast line, a fast lane or a secure lane. 
and I think those are growing exponentially, as, uh, particularly as the economies are coming back and the trade is really growing quite rapidly. It's always been robust, but it's, it's really growing now. So I see more and more of that happening. One thing that we haven't uh, been able to complete is what's called pre-clearance. And pre-clearance is where you actually um, uh, pass customs in the interior of, say, Mexico, so that you don't even go uh, essentially through a border checkpoint. Um, it's a, a process that we have only in a few limited places uh, around the world. Uh, it requires negotiation of certain very sensitive issues, uh, privileges and immunities, for example, that need to be employed in both countries. Uh, but I, I think that it is uh, a goal to which uh, we should strive uh, because it will help facilitate trade. And as much as we have put into the, the physical ports on the, on the land entry, uh, that, that work is not keeping a pace with the amount of trade that we have. So we have to look for ways to expedite, to pre-clear, what have you, take pressure off the land ports while ensuring that we have a strong safety regime. You would concur with that? Absolutely. And I think, well, if I may add something to it, pre-clearance is one of those programs in which we have done almost everything. So we're 98% uh, uh, of the solution we have devised, we have negotiated, we have set up. Uh, if we don't keep on pushing it quickly, whether obviously within this administration or at the beginning of the next administration, it is also one of those processes in which you might lag behind for a number of months or a year or so. And then the kinds of opportunities that we have built together might be lost and we may go down all the way down to 60% and we will have to rethink about it and renegotiate it. So. I think it is a good example of how, on all of these initiatives, we need to, st we need to keep uh, the, the pace and we need to keep pushing forward as quickly and as, uh, as uh, uh, with this sense of urgency that, uh, that Secretary Napolitano has also stressed, even if there's a change of administration, because the opportunities and the benefits from getting that last 2% are very, very significant. Does it help us, let me just uh, follow up on this, does it help the fact that immigration, particularly legal immigration, is down so much recently to have a sensible conversation about the border in this country? Is this well, the, the, you know, the plain fact of the matter is, is that there's more manpower and technology at that border than ever before. Uh, and the plain fact of the matter is, is, is that illegal migration into the United States hasn't been this low probably since 1971, 1970. Um, uh, so is there still illegal migration? Yes, um, but it is, is it um, much more under control than it was at its peak? Uh, absolutely, and I say this just uh, from my own experience and from the amount of time I've spent on the border. You will still have discussions of illegal immigration in this, in this country uh, as, as just part of the presidential debate. Um, but I, I think that um, the, f the fact that it hasn't been uh, as much a, a linchpin issue or a red hot issue, it's still debated, no doubt. And in certain places in the country, it's still a hot, hot issue. Uh, but the fact that the border and the numbers at the border are just materially different, it's a hard message to get out. I mean, that's, you know, that's a hard, perception to change, but I think as that perception changes uh, to match what is actually happening on the ground, it does open space to do some of these other initiatives that uh, Alejandro and I have discussed today. And I think it is clearly the case that um, even in the midst of this massive international economic crisis that the world experienced only a few years ago, Mexico's rate of growth has uh, been steadily increasing. It was one of the countries that recovered more quickly from that economic crisis. We did it without high levels of inflation, without a significant devaluation, picking up levels of employment re relatively rapidly and improving social services such as universal health coverage and opportunities for education and also for new jobs, which is also one of the underlying determinants of the lower levels of migration in, into the United States, undocumented migration. So I think we still need to work on that agenda. Uh, it is an important agenda for us in Mexico and also binationally, but it is also uh, an indication of uh, the increasing level of, uh, 
uh, economic development in our country, and I think it also gives us additional opportunities to enhance that economic development as well uh, under the current policies and hopefully under the future policies as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you to, to both secretaries. If anyone, by the way, before you clap, if anyone wants coffee, there is actually coffee over here. We've been keeping away from it. Thank you to both ambassadors for coming. It's wonderful to see you sitting next to each other at, at this discussion. We hope to hear from both of you together at a future session as well, they talking have, about the relationship. They even have matching ties. They even have matching ties, and I'm sure this was <laughs> planned. <laughs> but thank you, Secretary Poiré, and thank you, Secretary Napolitano, for being with us today. Thank you.